Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome back. Once again, I hope everyone is uh, doing well. Uh, today, we're going to start moving in to animals that you're, well, not at first at least, but we're going to move into animals I think you're going to be more familiar with uh, within a few minutes at least, let's just say. Um, so let's get started. Um, I want to tell you also that at this point in Bio 2, um, I mentioned this like from the very beginning, but the amount of information really starts to build up. So the next couple of weeks as we move towards the end of the semester, the amount of content, particularly in lab, is going to take off. There's going to be a lot of information. Um, that's the downside. The, the upside is that quite often the information we do you're more familiar with. So we're hoping that that balances off to where uh, you do well. In general, uh, although there's more information, we tend to see students do better, I think, at this point, but it depends on a lot of factors. So um, you'll notice I've changed the title. You might have 2C up or something a little different than that. That's okay. You'll have the same lecture as me here, hopefully, but we're going to be talking about fish, amphibians, and reptiles as we move through today. So um, there's nothing in this figure. Sometimes I see a neat picture that um, uh, moves me in some way. I'm like, wow, look at that. And so I put it into my PowerPoints because it's so neat looking to me. And students get overwhelmed because as a student, you know, you think you have to memorize all that. And actually, most of that you will find by the end of the semester, uh, you do know, um, but you haven't seen it all like that yet. So that's okay. Um, so anyway, this is mainly just for me. There's nothing I'm going to trick you or ask you on there. This is a cladogram that you have in lab that shows you some of the relationships of the different kinds of fish um, relative to what we're going to talk about. Um, I'm not going to ask you anything directly on this cladogram either. Uh, I just want you to be familiar with it in general. As we go through lab and lecture, we will talk about each of these groups. So you'll need to know them, but you won't need to know them on this chart. And this is a uh, summary of sort of all the classification um, of what we're going to be going through now. So again, there's nothing right here on the slide that you need to know directly. But as we go through, I'll explain what we're going to do and what you need to know. Once again, for lecture, this is what we're working on lecture right now. So in lecture, I'll give you specific things I want you to know. This slide really shows you sort of the taxonomy relative to lab. And uh, I have Tyler versus Mark up here just to point out that there's some differences uh, between different uh, instructors on what they think the correct taxonomy is. And uh, Professor Tyler Flissick, a good friend of mine, as well as Mark Cooper. Um, Tyler Flissick is our fish guy. Mark Cooper is our bird guy. And I'm the insect and reptile guy. So we all have slight differences on what we think is right in our particular area. And for your point, for your purposes, uh, I'm going to give you a very particular set of ways to do it so that it's very clear. Um, once again, though, if you're studying with Mark students or Tyler students, um, if their taxonomy or what they need to know is slightly different, uh, don't take their word for it and don't try to change their mind because we all do this a little bit different sometimes. So you're, if you're in my class, stick with my content. Okay, so we're talking about the phylum chordata now, and the phylum chordata um, are deuterostomes, just like the echinoderms were. They have radial and indeterminate cleavage, which means they have stem cells that can change into other things. They have interocelous development, which you should already know about, and the anus comes from the blastopore. That's the name deuterostome. The second opening becomes the mouth. So during development, when you when you if you took a balloon and you push through, like we talked about the gastrulation process, that first opening um, becomes the anus in a deuterostome. 
his second mouth, okay? They are generally bilaterally symmetrical, meaning you can divide them in only one way where you have a right and left. Um, and there's both invertebrates invertebrates and vertebrates in this group. Uh, but what the phylum chordata have is they all have these four characteristics. Okay, so, and we'll go through these. Uh, so this is a primitive sort of larval stage looking organism and basically all chordates, at least during development, start kind of looking like this tadpole thing. Every chordate in the phylum chordata looks like that in the beginning. Okay, so first, um, we have the first characteristics is, is this thing called a notochord. The notochord is this flexible rod that runs the length of the animal basically. And back in the, they may even still sell it now, but maybe I'm going to say in the eighties or nineties, um, they sold this uh, device. And if I can find it, I'll, I'll, I'll put it up. I'll put a picture of it up, but essentially it's a pole and you shake it and you can get in really good shape with this exercise equipment. Late at night, you know, they're always trying to sell you something. So there's this exercise device, apparently that you, you know, you hold this thing and you shake it. It always reminds you of the notochord. It's a big flexible rod. And if you stand certain ways, it's more difficult to do. Um, but, but essentially it's a plastic flexible rod, which you could do with almost anything. So this gives you sort of the starting balancing point uh, in a, in a chordate to have some sort of rigidity. Um, so an animal that can be sort of hard and, and have muscle can start to have a way to attach things to it. So that's the notochord. And then dorsally, meaning further towards the back of the notochord, we have the dorsal hollow nerve cord. And that also runs the length of the animal and they look like they're kind of right by each other. And sometimes people confuse them for being the same thing, but they're not. The dorsal hollow nerve cord is just like it sounds. It's a hollow space for which you in us in humans, for example, the nerve cord, your spinal cord can run. So it is a space. The notochord is this long, flexible rod. And then again, dorsally further towards the back, you have this space where the nervous system can run the length of the animal. They, uh, all the chordates also have pharyngeal gill slits, which are these right here, which are used for respiration. So there are slits along the side of the animal that allow oxygen, oxygenated water really to move through um, and capture oxygen and get rid of CO2. It's more of a breathing type of thing early on in development. So all chordates have that. Even humans early on in development have these pharyngeal gill slits. And by early on in development, I don't mean like you're one or two years old. I mean, before you're born, you know, way before you're born, like, you know, uh, mom's two months pregnant or I'm guessing now I'd have to look up and see kind of where this is. But I'm talking about way before you become a little human coming out during development, you have pharyngeal gill slits. My advisor, a world famous herpetologist was apparently born by a Bradstrom with these openings of his pharyngeal gill slits that didn't close properly during development and they sewed them closed. Um, and so he had a beard uh, most of his life as an adult uh, to hide the surgery scars and everybody always asked, so I'm just going to answer it. He could not breathe underwater. Um, for some reason, everybody thinks that because you had these openings in your neck, um, that, you know, you can swim underwater and breathe underwater. No, he didn't have gills. I'm just saying pharyngeal gill slits there, there were, there were openings, um, to that, but, and, and I'm sure that maybe occasionally happens in some kind of developmental error, but you don't breathe underwater. Okay. I get that question every semester. Uh, so those are pharyngeal gill slits. Then there's also a muscular postanal tail, which again, makes a lot of sense. Uh, so here's the tail and it goes past the anus. So a post anal, so past further than the anus, uh, there are, there's a tail and there are muscles associated with that. Again, in humans, uh, we don't have a tail that you can 
you know, visibly see, but we have these little tiny bones at the end past the rectum, uh, the coccyx, the little tiny bones. If you ever fell really hard on your butt, you could have broken your coccyx and, um, and it hurts really bad. There's not really all that much they can do. That is your post anal tail um, in a human there. So just little tiny series of bones that go to the very end past uh, what you'd normally think of where the end would be. That's the post anal tail. So a couple of different subphylums in that group. This first subphylum is the Eurocordata. These are called tunicates. Uh, when I was at UC Santa Cruz, uh, one of the most famous tunicate people of all time. Um, one of my mentors there that taught me many things I didn't even realize until I left. Dr. Todd Newberry, one of the founding members of UC Santa Cruz, was a world expert on tunicates and development. And this is what a tunicate looks like. It starts off in the larval stage looking like this. It has all four chordate characteristics. Uh, this is in the subphylum Eurocordata, which means it's a subgroup of the chordates. And then what they do is they go through this crazy development where they stick to a, a pier pylon or a rock or some kind of thing. And then they go through development where they turn in. This is the, so this is the larva here. And then this is the adult. So the adult is a filter feeder. They're sessile, they don't move, and they suck water in and capture nutrients and spit it out and capture it like that. But that development, anyone that studies developmental biology, um, this is a key animal because it has these characteristics in it and yet it changes um, as it becomes uh, this adult uh, form. And then we have the subphylum uh, cephalochordata, uh, the cephalochordata, they're also called the lancelets. Uh, they have all four chordate characteristics. Uh, they're probably the closest relative to vertebrates, which is what we'll talk about coming up soon. Uh, this particular species is called Amphioxus. You should know this genus just because it's famous once again in the developmental biology field of things. And it's an example of what we call paleogenesis. So when we um, study evolutionary biology and we look at all these different species, um, one concern that, that people bring up is how do you get all these different species? How do you evolve all these different kinds of life forms? And one interesting thing out of many is that sometimes relatively small genetic changes in development can have big changes on the organism as a whole. So in paleogenesis, what happens is by changing a couple of genes in the developmental stage, um, this organism, the Amphioxus or the Cephalochordata, they keep basically most of their juvenile characteristics and they turn into an adult. They become a sexually reproductive adult, but they maintain most of their juvenile characteristics. Uh, they don't change drastically um, in their development. On the opposite side of paleogenesis is paleo morphosis and in paleomorphosis what you do is the animal changes a great deal but it keeps one or two the number doesn't really matter so much larval traits okay so what you have is these are sort of two ends of the developmental spectrum on one side you have changes that result in a juvenile becoming an adult, but it keeps most of the juvenile traits. And then in other species, other organisms, as an example, the organism keeps like only a couple juvenile traits, but otherwise changes into the adult form. Um, so again, they're, they're related to each other. They're just different varying amounts of how many larval traits you keep. Do you keep a lot of juvenile or larval traits 
or just a couple. And it turns out just small changes in genetics can lead to those very big differences. And so in this particular case, we have paleogenesis. Then we get to the subphylum vertebrata, which contains then all the vertebrate animals. And these animals will have backbones, uh, kind of like us, like our vertebral column, but not quite exactly like what you're used to yet, uh, because our backbones are made up of bone. And we don't quite start with bone. Before we get to bone, we have uh, some intermediates. So the way the subphylum vertebrata forms is they'll have, first of all, they have all four chordate characteristics at some point uh, with modifications to them. And they will end up having this uh, vertebral column that is forming. And that'll form by what's called the neural crest, tissue that's pushing up like this and forming this loop. So it's going to push this tissue this way and close off there. So you'll end up with your notochord and your dorsal hollow nerve cord. And then this tissue here is what's going to lead to our um, backbone, as we call it. It's going to wrap around that. So we're going to get to that now. Now, when we talk about some of the changes we're seeing uh, as we move into the vertebrates and what is the advantage that evolution might favor um, the development of vertebrates, uh, we get into a couple of different things that are important. First of all, uh, we have a living endoskeleton uh, and muscles that can grow and change with the animal. Um, when, you, when you think back to things like uh, the crustaceans and insects, they have this hard outside shell, which is good. It prevents them from drying out and it gives them some protection. Uh, but because it's on the outside, uh, anytime they're going to grow bigger than that, they have to grow a new, they have to, it's dead tissue essentially. So they have to shed it and grow a new one. The idea with vertebrates, as we see this evolutionary change, we're moving the skeleton inside. Um, and again, it's not that it's better per se, uh, because there are still arthropods around, no doubt. But as animals get bigger, um, you need a different methodology. So this endoskeleton can grow with us, which is quite different than having it on the outside. So there's a limitation that arthropods have, although a very successful group. You don't find very many very large ones, um, in part because of that lack of ability to grow that uh, skeleton. Okay, so living endoskeleton can grow with us, uh, much better for larger animals. It also gives a place for bone, uh, for, for muscle attachment on the bones. Um, we're also going to see better pharynx and efficient respiration system. So as the animals become better at um, getting um, oxygen out of the air and become larger in size, their metabolic rate's gonna go up and their ability to sustain that's gonna go up, uh, which is better in a bigger animal um, because they're gonna need to get more food and live longer um, and, and have a different sort of strategy uh, as they move forward in life um, evolutionarily. Uh, they'll have more advanced nervous system in most we'll see a more complex nervous system um, and we'll get into that. There are exceptions though, when you look back on the invertebrates like the cephalopoda, um, which, which is the, the, the squid and the uh, octopods and all those animals, those animals get fairly large and have a pretty complex nervous system, but they're kind of an exception relative to most of the vertebrates. Um, and we'll see paired limbs to help with increased movement. Okay, now uh, when we look at uh, chordate evolution, uh, there'll be a bunch of chordates. You don't have to worry about this right now because we'll go into these as we go through them. Um, we're gonna see changes that occur in a fairly sort of consistent set of time. So we're gonna see the vertebrate first coming along and then jaws will be coming up next, chewing mouth parts teeth and lungs and legs, amniotic egg, hair and feathers, and that'll get us all the way through birds and mammals as we get there. So we'll start with our first group of fish, which is the super class Agnatha, and the order here is Myxiniformes, and these are called hagfish, marine 
scavengers. Um, they secrete slime on the outside of their body and they lack scales and paired appendages and they will tie themselves in this knot like this and secrete this slime if they're attacked um, and make it difficult for things to uh, attack them and they also use that knot uh, to create leverage as they're pulling food off because they don't have chewing jaws the agnatha lack so a means without natha those are jaws the agnatha lack chewing jaws and then we have the super class also agnatha once again our second group the petromyzontiformes that's a good one right uh, these are called lampreys and this is not a lamprey this is the fish these are the lampreys that are parasites that are on it uh, that are marine and freshwater they live in both environments and they migrate between them and they have this larva called the amicetes larva which is a filter feeder that looks kind of like this and it's kind of like the lancelet and they lack scales and paired appendages and they are parasites as you see here again no chewing jaws they are a parasite they stick to fish and chew on the side of it and then we're going to move into the jawed structures of fish the evolution of jaws and this most likely developed from gill arches, so the pharyngeal gill slits. Uh, the muscle is already there, and as you use some of those uh, in development, as you change some of those, you can change the position of the muscles and the size of them so that we think that most likely what happened is things like chewing mouth parts evolve from those gill slits. Um, because they're already there and uh, slight changes over time in development could give you perhaps that sort of structure um, and allow for an active defense against predators. Also, they can get thicker um, and instead of armored plates, um, you have the de emphasis on armored plates, which is probably what they're there for in the beginning. Uh, they're used to protect the gills and they're used for respiration uh, but as they get thicker they provide a sort of protection around the head region but also they have the muscle attachment to create leverage um, for chewing and that's how we think uh, the jawed fish arrived okay uh, i'm going to stop right there in this lecture and then we'll move into sharks uh, momentarily